What's up, my good people of the internet? And of course, welcome to my beautiful Interverse tribe. People, one question I often wonder is, what exactly does it even mean to be good? Eventually, I came to realize that there's so much good in the universe that it's easier to define this word by describing what it isn't. The etymological definition of good traces from Old Germanic, and it originally meant true to purpose. So when we look at the negation through apotheosis and start asking what good is not, what we can say is that it's anything that keeps us from being true to our purpose. That's not good. I like looking at it this way because it explains why pretty much every experience we have is potentially able to unlock new understandings about ourselves. Our guest today is Madeline Elizabeth, an intuitive healer and sole purpose coach who utilizes a wide array of good tools for bringing out the potential in others. I'm sure all of us can relate to a time in our lives when we didn't know what our true purpose for being on earth was all about. And working from a place of recognition of the divine nature of all beings, Madeline is able to inquire within herself, tap into the Akashic field and flow state in intuitive communication and exploration with her clients on a soul level. And it works because the spark of consciousness within each person is the same spark and we're all able to guide ourselves and each other in this way when we fearlessly intend to bring unconditional love and growth to our situation and we ask ourselves these questions and listen to the answers honestly. There's much more to say about the gifts Madeline brings but let's let her talk about that and get this show on the road and we'll let her kick us off here today with the gift of a guided meditation to ground us and bring us into our present moment wherever that is in space and time. So if you can, if you're in a place where that's possible, please join us for a little meditation. And if you can't, just do what you can to be present with whatever it is that you're needing to do while you listen to this episode. And welcome to Interverse, Madeline, and thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. All right, so let's just close our eyes and sit up nice and straight from the belly. Align the back of your head over your tailbone. And just tune into your heart space. And sense your inhales and the air coming in your nostrils and coming out of the nostrils. And call all of your awareness into this present moment from all timelines, all dimensions, places that you've left pieces of yourself or maybe projected yourself into the future, call all of those pieces of you back here into your heart space. And breathe in light from the top of your head, behind the eyes, down the throat, into the heart space. And fill your heart with as much light as you need today. And when that feels complete, bring that light down through the belly and the hips, down the legs, down out through the feet like roots growing down into the earth. And bring that light deep down into the core of Mother Earth, connecting with below. And wrap those roots around the core of Mother Earth and just feel how supported you are. And feel the abundance that's available and the nurturing from the mother. And bring that energy back up through the roots of your feet, through the legs and the hips, through the belly. And fill your heart space up with as much energy from the earth as you need. Connecting above and below within. And then just imagine that energy coming out and filling your entire energetic field around your body. And tune into your heart beating in your chest and with each heartbeat, imagine filling the entire space that you're in with the energy of your heart. 
in the entire room or vehicle you're in or wherever you're at and just keep extending it further and further out covering the entire city you're in going further and further covering the entire state you're in reaching out further with each heartbeat covering the entire country the entire continent and extending out further beyond planet Earth. And just feel your interconnectedness with all things. And just come back into the heart space. And sense the Earth beneath you, or the chair you're in, and the subtle sounds in the room. And when you feel complete, open your eyes. All right. That is a beautiful way to kick things off. And I thank you for being here. I thank you for the gift of the presence that you just helped us all cultivate. And also thank you for the gifts that you actually physically brought me. <laughs> I uh, find it very synchronistic, everything that has happened since we met like 20 minutes ago, <laughs> where, first of all, you told me about how I would have a selenite on a stick, like a spear or a staff, and then I went and produced that for you and showed you that. <laughs> <laughs> and this afternoon and in general, I was like, oh, I have someone coming over that's pretty psychic. I really need to energetically clear my house and like sage things and all that and i did not do that before you got here because i was too busy doing like physical cleaning and other preparatory work and energetically cleansing my body with some meditation actually not unlike what we just did and then you gifted me sage and palo and grass rope all sacred tools for energetic clearing and cleansing and a little piece of selenite which is my favorite stone so all around, bravo, great job with the <laughs> synchronistic gifts, and thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, thank you for receiving. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit more about the synchronicity that your life is going through right now and tell people a little bit about yourself. I mean, I did just describe you in this introduction, but words can't capture an infinite being, so it's better to let that infinite being use their own words. Well... I just want to say that like, I feel like this has been a long time coming with you because my very first festival I ever went to last year, Highbury, I met a friend, Mary Rose and Erin, and she gifted me your card. And I was talking about podcasting and she was like, you should get in touch with my friend Chance. And I've had your card for a year now and just recently reached out to you finally and so I feel like this has been a long time coming. So I'm grateful for that. So yeah, man, there's a lot of synchronicities and change and shifts going on with myself. And I can see it in the collective and a lot of people waking up to their purpose and really desiring to deepen their understanding of who they really are and connect with the truth of their being. That's the journey that I've been on pretty heavily since 2012. And of course, the journey is never ending, but I'm really grateful for for these last few years. <laughs> so you're like me and you kind of had a monumental 2012 experience that kicked off a bunch of transformations in yourself following that, right? Yes. The Mayan calendar prediction of the world ending in 2012. To me, I never took that literal, but I harnessed it to end a particular cycle in consciousness and start something else. And I feel like we're all able to use these particular energetic nexus points and in our life stories as uh, jumping off points into something different or not if we don't. But we have, we have opportunities like this all the time. It, it is what you make it. And I think 2012 was definitely one of those things. Yeah, man, back in 2012, I really started focusing on getting healthy in my physical body. 
I was feeling this like deep need to like do something different with my life. I was incredibly unhappy. I was in a toxic marriage and man, I started exercising and getting good nutrition in my body, getting around a positive group of people and getting the appropriate nutrition in my body started awakening my Kundalini energy and awakening my intuitive gifts that I, um, when I was 17, I had this guy at this church camp prophesy over me and told me that I would have the gift of prophecy one day. And I was going to be a visual person and I would know things that other people wouldn't and see things that other people wouldn't. And I had kind of forgotten about that until that year when I was getting my nutrition really right. And I started like having these experiences where a thought would come in my mind and just be like, Oh, I wonder why that came in. And then, you know, a couple months later finding out it was true and just like really serious stuff. And I was like, man, I really need to pay attention to this. And I remembered, and I still to this day have the journal entry that I wrote from that, that church camp that I went to from that guy prophesying over me. <laughs> that is pretty weird. And interesting that it comes from a religious type of perspective because Really, there are mystics in all the religions that have a much more expanded understanding of what's possible for humanity and our relationship to the creative force, the infinite. That religion is called God. And to be able to see something before it happens, it requires that you're actually paying attention to your inner voice and to your inner eye to know what it is that you're seeing and not just treat it as a fleeting thought. I think all of us can relate to some ability to perceive a connection between the inner and outer world. And for me, actually, I even had a lot of times lately where I'll see somebody in my mind's eye or I'll imagine have a little movie play in my head of some interaction with a person and they won't even be around. And then they'll just like pop up out of nowhere. And that exact little snippet that I just saw will play out. It's pretty strange. It's not like I can do it on command. Like, okay, this is what's going to happen next. I'm a fortune teller now. It's just almost as if you're running ahead a couple minutes <laughs> in your mind or something. I don't know. But to me, because everything is emerging from the infinite, that means that the past, present, and future are all in one spot and emerging from the same spot. So there's not really a difference between how you know what you remember versus how you know where you're at right now versus what you are going towards in the future. It's all, all of the same stuff, you could say. <laughs> all simultaneously happening now. <laughs> right, which is also why it's possible for somebody to tap into past life memory or even unlock things that they don't remember about their current life that might be holding them back from what it is they are here to do in life and what is going on for them in the future. So I'm really interested in what you're doing for, I don't, I don't like these word clients. I don't want to say patients for our family, our human family, our tribe, mm -hmm. people that come to you and want help finding their soul purpose or their soul path. What kind of things do you do to actually discover that? So I was trained in a modality and that was kind of like a stepping stone for me of attuning me to this energy of the Akashic Records. And I got my attunement. I did this modality training and that really opened up a lot for me. I started working with clients and it was in a very structured way in how I was trained. And as things have grown and evolved, it, that's evolved with me. So the main readings that I do for people that people feel called to, I call a soul blueprint reading. Where I bring that information in is I'm, I'll either use a pendulum or all muscle test, but we all have eight of these divine energies within us. Typically, like if you were to say like a pie chart and there's eight ingredients of sorts in this pie, typically there's a primary ingredient to the pie. Sometimes people have a primary and a secondary energy, but so most people just have a primary energy that their vibrational spectrum is made of. So I bring that information in from the Akashic Records and help them to understand that. But the thing is that's so beautiful about it is that you always know because we can't get away from our soul. <laughs> like we are it. So what's so beautiful about it is that when I do these readings, 
people it's just, there's this deep understanding and this deep, like confirmation of like what they already deeply knew about themselves and also their shadow aspects. Like how does, what's the light attributes of this divine essence and what's the shadow. So like for me, for instance, my primary energy I bring is divine love. And so it's the energy of the healer. It's the energy of like being the glue that holds everybody together and just presence alone is healing, whether you're doing it professionally or not. You know, the shadow aspect is that we'll stay in relationships for way too long, way past the expiration date and just keep putting up with stuff and just keep giving and giving and giving and giving and not receiving because we're just like, oh, I just love you and I can just love so much stuff. And it's just like, that's a shadow aspect of love is like, we have to turn back to ourselves and like love ourselves first and not give from an empty cup, not from a place of lack. And so that's like the main portion that I do, but my readings have evolved with people especially because some people are that are interested in it are at a frequency rate where they're just starting to wake up and going into that information right away might kind of get them ungrounded a little bit. And so what I do with all my readings now is I start out with just like basic numerology stuff, something that like almost everybody can relate to because this is my date of birth. So I'll do the numerology for them. And then I do something called your galactic signature and it comes from the Mayan, the <laughs> I don't even know how to describe it, a cosmology of sorts, this like law of time teachings. And so I'll go over their galactic signature with them, going into a different dimension and then really bringing forth the soul blueprint. And what I love about it is that I channel in the soul blueprint first, and then I figure out their numerology and their galactic signature, and then I can see the accuracy and I can tie it all together and see like, okay, here's these common threads between all three of these things. And it's just... Most people are already living within their soul's purpose. They're just not living up to the fullest expression of what they could be. Totally, totally. Most everything is good. Basically, the only thing that's not good is when you consciously choose something that's not good for someone else or yourself. And everything else, even if it's just circumstantial aspects of your life that you wouldn't even have necessarily chosen for yourself if you could re-choose everything about your life right here and now, those things are still teaching you that what you need is to earn that different state. And so it's positive and there's no mistakes even or failures, you know, as long as we recognize the potential to grow in every moment. So I find it very interesting to be going into multiple levels of divination, numerology and astrological information. I personally study the heck out of as many different systems as I can because you get these correspondences between them that line up and let you go, okay, this is obviously, there's got to be something to this. Otherwise, how would these two different groups or two different schools of thought be describing the same thing? I mean, essentially what we're looking at is one light split into multifacets of colors that then continually combine and make millions of frequencies and expressions, but all coming from the one. So mm. We each have the ability to go into that spot and find the other there, not just be with them in the physical 3D world. In the physical 3D world, your electrons repel each other. That's what gives you the feeling of touch. It's, it's actually a form of electromagnetic separation in a way. At least that's what they say. What I'm getting at is the real connection between people is on the inner level. That's where we're actually one at, you know? So whenever that's where you're diving into, that's the well that you're taking your cues from when you're working with another person and your intention is just for their unfoldment. Because what is love? You're talking about divine love. Love is the recognition of the highest potential, which is in infinity, in another being. And acting out of love is doing whatever is in alignment with that potential's unfoldment. So, And that sometimes means saying no, back to what you're saying. There's a lot to unpack about that. Okay, so something that's coming up is when you were talking about that it's all good. So there's another aspect of a reading that I do that's like not only with this soul blueprint, but what we do is we go into the records with your intention of, hey, man, I've got this serious pattern that I can't overcome in my life. I've got this relationship. Why do I keep manifesting these relationships? 
why is this stuff keep happening in my family or, or these things? And what you were talking about, the only thing that's negative is what's keeping us from our soul's purpose, really stepping into that. And so how that comes about is through negative choice. It's karma, it's choice consequence. And so what happens like within this other aspect of the reading is we go into the records with the intentions that you set and we inquire, you know, why is this here? And we find out where it stemmed from. Everybody has a record and it's all coming from somewhere. And, and it's stuff that we're not even aware of sometimes. Sometimes there's family curses that have been placed on you like 17 lifetimes ago that's still affecting you. You have no idea. And it, you know, or like a vow that you've taken for poverty or something in another lifetime or contracts we make with people that were negative choices that we made, whether that's accepting energy or things like that. It's like these negative choices is actually what solidifies the consequence. And then we continue to repeat these choices over and over and over. And it's a new choice that has to be made. And so when awareness is brought to, oh, okay, this is why all these traumatic experiences keep coming to me. I'm like holding that in my vibrational field from this experience that I have. Okay. Now I've cleared it out of the records. I've transmuted the energy next time that this comes around. I can just be aware of it and go, mm, you know what? I'm going to make a different choice this time. It shifts the pattern. It shifts the karma. And so I just wanted to go into that because that's a part of the readings that I do as well is let's figure out what's blocking and hindering you from fully accessing your potential, your divine purpose. Beautifully said. And even when it comes to things that are outside of our choosing that occur in a patterned way, like you said, things with our families, for example, you know, say you go through a rash of deaths of people that you care about that seems too many too fast to be really quote unquote fair or to be in alignment with you being happy. And what is that teaching you? Even that situation has something to teach you about choice, including giving you the opportunity to choose a different perspective other than a sorrowful one when it comes to parting with people on the physical plane. And whenever you are still just looking at only your physical plane, earth life, as what is real or what matters or all that you are, all that you have, then of course it's going to seem completely absurd whatever life throws at you in a way to try to break you on an ego level. <laughs> but if you were able to zoom out and go to the record or tap into whatever crystal matrix structure in the omniverse actually contains the majority of your soul fractal, you could see that, oh, whenever I came in, I knew that these things were going to happen. And I agreed to come in with that burden because A, it would be a wake up point for me in case I needed it. And they're going to be programmed throughout the entire life journey for any point that you're starting to forget your true divinity. Those things are going to be there ready to show you if you so choose to accept it. And so, you know, in the case of people dying, which is maybe like the worst for a lot of people, the worst possible thing to imagine is a bunch of people you love dying. That still gives you the chance to make the choice of I choose to retain my loving connection to this person. I choose to let go of my attachment to them being here with me physically and I can transcend the notion that we're even separate. Opening that door changes everything, especially if you're getting into your latent psychic abilities as a human being. You will actually continue to have interactions with that person, whether it's in dreams or in some other synchronistic way. And so that's just one example. But I feel like it's pertinent to most people because we've all had at least some experience with death at this point. And to clarify what I mean about our divine nature, the fact of the matter is whether or not anyone wants to accept it is we're all the thing that people call God. We are all emanating from it and are literally it. You can't hide from that responsibility for eternity. You might get an entire lifetime where you stay asleep and keep forgetting it, but that creates a whole lot of suffering because ultimately you're rejecting who you really are. And even people listening right now might even potentially be upset about that statement if they have a dogmatic way of looking at the universe where they need some sort of external power to be greater than themselves because it is scary to realize that the ultimate power lies within you mm. if you are not able to trust yourself so that's why it's so important to to love yourself and point that back inward because you have to be able to trust yourself you're creating all of this <laughs> and if you yeah. can't trust yourself to create consciously you can be okay with the mistakes you're going to make you will make mistakes but 
if you can trust yourself to be present with them and learn from them, then all those mistakes were not negative, I guess. Yeah, what you're saying is bringing up something that I just saw today. When I was looking at it, I was like, why am I seeing this right now? And why is this in my reality? And it's for this conversation is I was cleaning out the back of my car because I'm like moving and I saw this plaque that was given to me that had a scripture on it from John. And it says, I am the vine and you are the branches. Dwell in me and I in you. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So understanding that if we're aware that God is within us and we are that, we know we can do anything. And like you said, having that responsibility of knowing that we are the divine creators of our reality, you know, it puts the ball in our court to have to take action and like really own our choices. Yeah, because we didn't create this construct of physical reality to share together just so that you could go, oh, I'm God, and then snap your fingers and change everything instantaneously. What is there to learn from that? How does that affect everyone else's freedom in this space together, which is also you and your freedom, in a sense? By looking at things from sort of new age BS, uh, law of attraction without law of action perspective, you're going to always be let down by this idea that you're actually infinite and you actually have the power to do and manifest anything because you're ignoring an important part of yourself, which is that you are in a physical world with other beings and that your freedom to have and manifest and to choose and create is completely contingent on everyone else's freedom to do the same because it's such a complex world that we live in a society that we live in, which mirrors the complexity of our own internal organism and all the billions of beings that create just one human body that you can't live without the other people having the same level of freedom as you can. And it shows all around us in the world whenever you look at the most socially damaged parts of the world, it's where there are people with the least close to people with the most, wherever there's the biggest divide in equality. Of course, that doesn't mean there's like a political solution to this or passing a law. It's all a reflection of the inner poverty that we still are experiencing when it comes to balancing out our spiritual awareness with our physical world presence. I think too, like what keeps coming up is it goes back to balancing the masculine and the feminine because here we are, we can do the manifestation stuff. We can put the intentions out on the medicine wheel. The West is the female energy of introspection and goals. The, the East is the male energy. And when you think about a female and you know her reproductive organs, she receives she's intuitive, she's creative, and it's a very different energy than the logical man and the action and the giving. Being in a space of setting intentions and listening to what messages are brought to you, whether it's turn left here, go into this store, talk to this person, say this, they're gonna give you the card of this person who's gonna connect you to this. We still have to take action. We still have to be willing when we get the information that comes into the field that we have to be willing to take action on it. This is how we can be combining the masculine and feminine and allow them to work together in tandem where the, the masculine is helping the feminine, the feminine is helping the masculine. And when we do this within ourselves, like you said, it's for the collective. Every single action that we take within ourselves, when we're balancing that within ourselves, we're literally helping radiate that out around us and empowering other people just by really doing our own work. Yeah, we recreate the original creation in that balancing. We take the two polarities of left and right, the masculine and feminine, the up and down on the teeter-totter. And by making them still, we can finally see that they're actually balancing on a middle point that is motionless. And that's the infinite still white light center point of the mandala that you are. And you really can't see it if you're polarized too far to the masculine or the feminine. And I go through cycles of remembering and forgetting this inner place all the time. I'm quite sure that every time you go to sleep, though, wherever you are, you go and recharge in this white light. That's why you have to sleep. You have to have stillness to balance out. My point in saying all this is, how do you balance out the left and the right? That's exactly how, is by cultivating stillness in yourself. That's why we started with a grounding practice where we connected the upper and the lower, the yeah. heaven and earth, the 
inner and outer, the left and right, all correlates to the same structure, the same creative principle, you could say. Because these polarities don't exist strictly to challenge us or to create impasses or an immovable object and an unstoppable force. <laughs> it's not like that just to create a standstill of permanent nothingness. It is actually to our benefit to have this system of polarities. When used wisely, it gives us the ability to inhale life as deeply as we wish, to exhale in the most relaxed and full way possible. Every time we practice that in-breath and out-breath consciously, we go more deeply into a balance point between those two polarities where we can see both sides of it for what they really are, and that's where we create. That's what we create out of, whether it's art or whether it's children or whether it's, I mean, everything. Yeah, this is like one of my favorite subjects to talk about polarities. One of the things that I do in my soul blueprint reading is we figure out what soul group of origination you're from, which star system in the cosmos you originally went into, and it like makes up the essence of your soul. And mine's Polaris. And so my whole entire life has been really built upon all these learning experiences of really understanding polarity. And what you've been saying really reminds me because I'm a yoga teacher as well. And one of the things that I do when I teach yoga is really empower people to understand, you know, that your right side of your physical body when you're practicing yoga and you're coming into the stillness, right? So we're coming into stillness and we ground ourselves. But then as we're moving and we're taking action and then we pause and then it's the surrender and grace and that middle point. But when we take action and we realize, oh man, this side is like much more flexible than this side, then I help the students tune into their bodies like, okay, tune in right now. Which side feels more balanced to you? Which side do you feel more energy flowing? Is there stuck energy here? And really educating them on like, okay, this is your creative side, your, your receiving side, or this is your masculine side, this is your logical giving side and action. And which side do you feel like is out of balance? And so it's really teaching people that everything that you ever need to know, your body shows you, it's revealing to you constantly, everything about your mind, and even the in breath and the out breath, and the pause, the surrender, the grace, it's that middle ground of the wholeness. It's so beautiful. Even like when I was little, I had these extreme opposite parents. I lived with my mother 10 months out of the school year in Montana, who was really strict, fundamentalist, Christian, very like, I don't want you to make the same mistakes as me. And you can't do this. And you can't hang out with this like very, very strict. And then in the summertime for like two months out of the year, I was with like my like free spirited hippie dad who was an alcoholic and, you know, doing drugs and all these things. Very, very opposite. And for me as a child to have to like go back and forth between those two energies and like feel the difference and like understand and just try to piece it all together and to come out as an adult and have this really good balance of understanding what are my moral values and how can I be more flexible in what I've received and knowledge going back and forth between these polarities and this masculine and feminine tuning into my intuitive side I've spent years being in my masculine side I'm an Aries woman Hell yeah, Aries in the club. Yeah. <laughs> cool. So it's like very, I'm a very kind of masculine woman. And it's funny because people that know me now are like, you just exude all this femininity, goddess, priestess energy, but they haven't seen me my whole life. I'm just now beginning to embody both and really find this wholeness. But I've spent so long just like, I don't need men. I, I, can, I can be a single mom. I can have my own business. And I can do this and this and this. And very masculine, action-oriented, always out, just doing all this stuff. And it's like I've just learned to just sit and to just be. And this whole being is the new doing. Because then we can be and receive the information that we need because we're all psychic. <laughs> we all have this within us. It's just, are we really cultivating it? How much are we doing in our life to cultivate these gifts and then tune into that and then take action with the masculine? Maybe we could talk a little bit about how to cultivate 
those psychic gifts because that what the mystic, what the artist, what the creative person, what the healer, what the alchemist, what they're all doing, at least in this particular quadrant of consciousness, to heal our current imbalance is typically finding a way to jack up the sensitivity somehow. And sometimes you go too far. Sometimes there's a plant medicine experience that opens the windows during a lightning storm and things get a little wet in the interior. And then sometimes that can lead to, to mold and all kinds of stuff. But then you wind up spring cleaning after you get through that mucky part. And, and that's actually knocking the dust off of things metaphorically of your instruments. That's how you get around to higher levels of sensitivity. So whether that comes through cleansing the body with foods and plant medicines that do that, and especially the internal organs, those are all filter systems, just like the air filter in your car or your house. If you never change it or clean it, then whatever it caught is still there. And because your organs are basically filtration systems for real to the energy that you're taking in from the cosmos physically and on a light level, the more crap is on the filters, the more stuff that is going to show up on the screen in the form of actual physical experiences and internal feelings that correlate to those experiences that, well, they might be like dirty because you haven't cleaned things up, to say, to say the least. They're not going to be orderly, I guess, is the, you're going to have less divine order in your life and not because the divine order isn't there, but because you aren't there to see it. Mm -hmm. You're not witnessing it because there's a speck on the lens that is keeping you from seeing the connection between your inner experience and your outer experience. So that's one way to improve your sensitivity, which is therefore going to improve your psychic gifts and your connection to those things is through physically cleansing the body, meditation like we talked about, and specifically meditation where, in my opinion, things where you're doing a consciously balancing act, whether it's consciously trying to not move. For me, that's impossible. I'm constantly making little jerks and twitches and the longer I can sit in meditation, the more and more still I get. And that's to me a, an obvious indicator of whether or not it's working for me <laughs> if I get more still. So that's one way. And then another way, I guess, to, and then I'll leave it to you to maybe describe more, but another way to improve our sensitivity is maybe through in the meditation state, trying to look at the screen in your mind instead of just closing your eyes and ignoring the what seems to be blackness and focusing your inner sight towards the third eye area in your forehead and you'll feel it. You'll feel it. You'll feel an actual almost like pressure building up in your head while you're doing it. And holding on to that is a great way to balance left and right also because it's a, a middle point. It's an, a chakra that rests between the left and right on the scale. So this is probably crap load more ways to, to find balance and, and open up your sensitivity. But to me, that is how we balance out the over-masculinization that we're currently experiencing. Just some really basic things if you are wanting to increase your intuition and maybe you're into meditation, maybe you're not, maybe you just need want to like start on this journey of, okay, what are some simple things I can do? For me, I got started in nutrition. My whole spiritual journey started with nutrition and waking up that kundalini energy within me. And so that is really key when we think about 95% of our serotonin levels are produced in our gut. If our gut's not working right, our brain's not going to be working right. And then it's easy for us to get trapped in emotions and feelings and all these things that can actually be caused from other things. Your breath, the inhale and the exhale, whenever, you know, we're mostly, most people are chest breathing, it really shallow breaths. And when we take deep, long inhales and slower, longer exhales, and we can train our body to be in that state all the time, because we have muscles in our bodies and they have memory. So it's like if we can train our bodies to be doing these really deep, slow breaths, then we stay in a rest and digest mode versus fight, flight, or freeze. When we're in that state, our heart rate is in a, a place of calmness and rest and digest. And when your heart rate's erratic, it sends a frequency through your whole being that drowns out your intuition. No matter what, always come back to the breath. The breath is one of the main things that we can just tune back into. And so getting back to the nutrition as well, there's three Ayurvedic super herbs that are tridoshic. They're for everyone's body that 
cleanse the pranic channels. They help open the crown chakra, help with wisdom and all of these things we're talking about. There's three of those that I utilize that really keep me clear. I don't know if I'm allowed to talk about those. Is that okay? Can I just share with them? Oh, okay. Unless you are somehow afraid that government agents are going to assassinate you for <laughs> giving away the secrets of life. I love you. I <laughs> love anyways, you. I'm just joking about that. I'm, I'm going to be disappointed if you don't tell me what these are. Okay. Are cool. <laughs> okay. So three Ayurvedic super herbs you can take literally at just go to the health food store, ashwagandha, turmeric, and trifala. And so those are really potent herbs. So even if like that's all you start is just start there. In the mornings, eat fruit for breakfast, just fruit for 21 days in a row and just see what happens. Your digestive system is waking up in the morning just like you. And so eating like a bunch of heavy carbs and sugar or meat, bombarding your system early in the morning is like getting up with a siren in the middle of the night, just like, like waking up like that versus waking up with just natural sunlight and the birds chirping. That's what fruit is for a digestive system in the morning. It's gentle. And, and so just doing those little things, it's your nutrition. Start there. The breath, really important. Simple things like crystals. Amethyst was the first crystal that I was really, really working with to help me connect with my psychic abilities and even just psychic attack from other people. It's really, really beautiful for that. You can sleep with it next to your bed or in your pillowcase. It can even help with like your dream state. I know for me, a lot of my prophetic gifts that are really important, the ones that are visions for the people, things that are coming through that are really important things or that I really need to know about relationships in my life and things like that come to me in my dream state. I was raised with this Christian background. And so I even think about these like stories of just like people being revealed in their dream state. It was a specific, Hey, get out of here, go do this. And, and the dream state is just so powerful for that and getting a good pillow so that the spinal fluid is flowing appropriately when you're sleeping, like that really helps. When I actually got a, a good pillow from my chiropractor is when I actually started remembering my dreams before that. I knew I would dream, but I would never remember them. So those are like simple little things <laughs> that people can just start doing to enhance their intuition. But if you're using fluoride toothpaste, if you're drinking tap water, you're ingesting fluoride into the body. This is a neurotoxin. This helps, this like calcifies your pineal gland. You know, this is directly linked to our intuition and discernment. And it's our signal of receiving information and sensing and picking up on these things. But we, it's all, it's available to all of us. Sometimes people get really touchy or defensive when you try to even suggest any of these changes for their life, whether it's just, hey, maybe start shopping where you can get organic and not pesticide covered food or whatever. And the point is, I mean, bringing this up is people get freaked out by the, when they start waking up to this, their denial takes over because and we're all in a level of it to an extent about certain things that we're doing. But the denial kicks in and you're like, oh, there's so many things that are toxified, so many things that are causing my inevitable death. What do I even do? What's the hope? What's the point? Don't look at it that way. Actually, what you should look at it as is there's so many pieces to this puzzle that if you're ever focused on one corner of the puzzle and you cannot find that piece to fit in that fucking spot and you're stuck and banging your head against the wall, guess what? There's all these other pieces. Just go work on those and you'll find the piece you're missing while you're looking through the other pieces. That's the best metaphor I can give for it. If you can't, you find you can't give up meat yet, but you know you should, but you're beating yourself up over it. Well, why not make a simpler change first? Why not allow your body naturally wants to heal these different things that are going on, going wrong with it, but it needs a certain level of energy to do any particular task. And it's not going to try until it has the right level of energy. Learn from your body. Be like your body. Don't make the changes that you don't have the energy for yet. Make the easy ones. Do the, that's what non-action's about. It's literally like you could try your hardest and, and sometimes you should, but you could also be sort of carefree and bumble through things and just do the, make the easy choices. Check the simple boxes off the checklist first in that order because each one you do, you'll get stronger and the next thing on the list will therefore be a little easier because you're a little stronger. I have a whole lot more to say, but <laughs> this is not this is not the, the place for it. I'm I'm learning way more by listening to you than I am 
than ta- by talking. So I'm going to cut it off again. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think if we go back to honoring our bodies as a temple, and when we think about if we were to visit this really sacred temple somewhere, what would we actually bring into that space? When I think about bringing things into my temple, I wasn't aware of my body before. I wasn't aware that there's programming in food and the way that that was taking over my body and and how even like parasites within within the digestive system, they have their own consciousness and this can be running all kinds of things and cravings and, and all this stuff. Understand that it is a process. In 2011 is when I stopped eating meat, but I still ate fish until last summer. So that's like seven years. It took me seven years from going from eating fast food, being a pescatarian for seven years to finally going vegetarian, like, okay, I'm not doing fish. I only did that for a couple months and then went vegan. But to understand that I went from (laughs) eating fast food in 2011 to like 2018, vegan. It takes time and to just be gentle on ourselves and to like focus on what are the changes that we're doing every day because then the vibration and the frequency we're sending out from like, oh, I'm doing something really good for myself. And okay, maybe I just ate a little less meat this week. Maybe I'm just going to like do once a week instead of three times a week. Or maybe it is finally letting that go or Whatever that is, do what empowers you. Do what's making your thoughts more positive. Those little things are so powerful. And our best is going to look different from day to day. And to just be gentle with ourselves too. There's going to be days where maybe I'm not going to be as mindful and, and present in my day. Did I have access to the proper nutrition that day? Did I have a really good night's sleep? All these things they contribute. So it's as long as we're just doing our best with what we have in that moment and what our intuition is guiding us to do, your body is so smart. If you're getting any hits that you need to take in less meat or you need to give it up or you should drink more water or start drinking cacao, which is my favorite thing. Listen, your body is so smart and knows what it's doing. But know that there is a difference in our bodies being smart and having this intelligence than other programs from food and pesticides and all these things taking over aspects of the brain and controlling that too. It's just time to get clear. It's time to like stop playing small in the world and treat our body as the temple that it is. And even down to the clothes we wear to understand when I wake up in the morning and I go to my closet and I can say, okay, how am I going to adorn my altar today? That I'm a temple and how I adorn my temple is my altar. How would you see an altar in a sacred temple? Somebody's probably not going to just throw some stuff on it. (laughs) You know? This is a perfect place to get back to because what we started out talking about was finding your soul's purpose for being on earth. If your body is a vessel for the soul and you have a really run down, janky, falling apart ruin of a temple, do you think your soul wants to hang out there? Probably checks out. Whether or not you believe this to be the case, your soul is an infinite fractal and you've got parallel lives running all over the place. And whichever one is most aligned with what you really want right now, that's where you're at. So if you want to have your soul, you literally need to be here. You need to call it in. You need to ask for it to be here with you by doing that which is in alignment with it. And what does that even mean? It means doing what you yourself your higher self, capital S self, want to do. What do you want to do? What is your soul other than that which motivates you to do one thing or another? And if what it is that's motivating you is a program that's been inserted forcefully, violently, or willingly, any of those things, then what you're doing is against your soul, basically. It's a soulless act. And it feels soulless. You know it. I mean, I know it when I I go to my job and I'm stuck in an office for eight hours a day and disconnected from the natural world completely. But even that is not completely soulless because even though I know it's not what's in alignment with my ultimate greatest good, while I'm there, I'm, I am channeling my soul. I am myself. I am as much as possible, even on the worst day. And I think it's good that you said that, that even you're not going to have your best day every day, but once you're, once you've broken some of these patterns, 
And then for me, even when I have a bad day where I quote unquote bad day where I'm not productive in the way that I wanted to be that day or in somehow in some sense, I've let myself down or disappointed myself. Even when it comes to eating, even if I ate poorly for that day, it's still not as poorly as I ate seven years ago when I was eating fast food. It's practically incredible compared to that. So <laughs> you just got to recognize that your worst right now is not anything like what your worst used to be. And you've come a long way and reclaiming your soul, re-embodying your higher self, that has to do with figuring out what it is that you actually want most and embodying and acting out on that and eliminating the stuff that's not from you. And even like thinking about, yeah, you going to your job, like I said, most people are still within their divine purpose. It's just not the highest expression. So maybe it's like you still are doing your soul work there, but like maybe you do desire to be doing this more or being out in nature more and understanding like this is the work that I do with um with cacao, the plant medicine cacao. This is like, oh, it's so magical. It it really helps us bring light to the density of our hearts and it tunes us to nature's frequency. And that's the thing is when we're, you know, behind, at a desk, behind a, you know, computer or in a cubicle or whatever that is, you know, we're not close to nature and that frequency. And, and that's even one thing we can do to increase our intuition. Get out in the morning and get your bare feet in the grass and let the sun shine on your face and just breathe it into your body. And just imagine all these light molecules just like encoding all of the cells in your body and lighting up your third eye, like little things like that. When you drink plant medicine, you're tuning to the frequency of nature and it reminds you who who you are and one thing I can say is it doesn't really matter what we do if our heart isn't open the heart and love is the energy of all creation and what I know is that when we make choices based off of money it shuts off energy to our heart and so when we make a choice from our heart and we say, okay, yeah, this is, you know, more logical because it brings in more money, but this is what I really want to do. What happens is when we do what we want to do and we're aligning to our soul's purpose, we're more fulfilled. So then we're sending this energy out in our field that because we're so fulfilled, it's exciting. It's, you know, we've got all this enthusiasm. We're going to attract more experiences into our reality that is just going to be in alignment with what we want to do and, and to have more prosperity and more abundance. And this is how we can manifest at the physical plane when we're in alignment with that. And then we're rewarded because we're doing what we really want to do. A lot of times just trusting and like getting rid of those little last little bit of encodements in the DNA that's telling you that that you still got to do this stuff to make the money. When we leap, that's what creates the net. The net's not there until the leap is taken. But also just know that when you take the leap, there's a free fall time. <laughs> like, just be aware that's there too. And, oh, I don't know what I'm doing, but I know that that's coming. When you're even free falling, when you think that you're in a place of security or comfort, you're still in a state of free fall. Maybe you're more in a state of free fall whenever you're in your comfort zone in a way. Mm. Whereas whenever you're taking the leap, it's more like you're jumping off of a diving board. And the great Duncan Trussell once put it, life is doing as many tricks as you can during the free fall off the diving board into infinity. Yes. I love that. <laughs> Before you hit the singularity or whatever. And where does this excitement come from? How do we clear these shadow programs that we're talking about? I think a really good starting point is what you said with getting your bare feet on the ground, finding ways to tune into the frequency of nature, which is a lot more still and silent. Even, even when there's sound, even when there's song, when you hear birds, it's coming out of silence. And then like in our, our normal lives, there's so much noise pollution and chaos that nothing hardly emerges out of silence <laughs> in a way. But my point in this is you're saying visualize the light coming into your body and transforming your cells and releasing the blockages. Visualize, visualize, visualize. That's the biggest thing that keeps coming up for me to try to express to people is that how I unlocked my own intuitive abilities, how I, how I work with crystals, how I am able to do Reiki energy work on somebody, how I know how to give 
massages, even though I was never trained. Where does the intuitive ability come from? It comes from imagining it first, just imagining, well, what would I do? Or even just playing around, like when it comes to crystals, just playing around, imagining that I do feel something related to whatever quality that that crystal is supposed to have, allowing the feeling that I start imagining in my body to be the bridge that connects me to attaining that feeling or that state. And then once my body and my brain now have a language to communicate whatever this state state is that I'm trying to cultivate, then I no longer have to imagine it. I start actually feeling it, especially when it comes to crystals or, or Reiki. That's how I even learned Reiki was by picking up selenite crystals and trying, holding my hands over them, holding them, trying to imagine the feeling of what it would feel like as I was holding them. To an extent, I didn't even have to imagine it. I could automatically, I could automatically kind of feel something. But my point is, if you create that bridge through your imagination, that is where your intuition comes from. And your imagination is not a fabrication that's an illusion. It is a sensory perception device of your consciousness. Mm. If you are talking about your five senses, the main sense is actually sight. Just replace sight and put the top star of the five points as being imagination <laughs> because your sight is your imagination. You just don't realize it. Your brain is taking in all these waves that are hitting your eyeballs and making a holographic representation inside of your head. Well, I mean, that's your imagination. That's my point is that. Imagination is actually the foundation, the grounds of everything. And any change that you want to bring about in your life or any sensitivity you want to cultivate, it starts with imagination. That goes for seeing people's auras, being perceptive of energy, everything. Becoming a better artist. Just try to open up that door, I guess. To an extent, it's a blessing whether or not that door opens for a person. Do you think everybody has the chance in this life to do what we're talking about? And it's not a fatalistic, deterministic thing where it's by the by the grace of God, you be saved or whatever. And you just have to hope that you're one of the lucky ones that gets woken up. Because I think that we all are basically choosing whether or not we wake up. And there's no inequality in that sense. I think that we all have the capability of being healers. We are each other's medicine. That's something that the plants have taught me too. Is literally all we need is sunlight and each other. And that was just really profound for me. But I also believe that we all have our own unique energetic signature that is bringing in certain gifts. And some are going to be stronger for some people than others. When I do these soul blueprints for people and understanding that like some people are going to be just naturally tuned into that energy much more than other people. There are some people that are very analytical. You know, that's a part of who they are at soul level. It's very like in the mind, logical. How does this work? I've got to figure out how this works. And it's some soul groups don't understand the emotional body whatsoever. That's just so mentally oriented. And then there's some that can get so overwhelmed because they feel all of it and they can sense all of it and they can hear all of it. We all have our own gifts and abilities. And that's what's so beautiful about it is we all have all of these divine energies within us. We just each have typically a primary one. That's why we're here to share that with each other. And we get to bring all these gifts together and be together as relatives and do what we actually are fulfilled by. Because I don't want to be doing the same thing that everybody else is doing. I want to bring my own unique ability and art and elegance and gifts to the people. And I want to be able to share with somebody else and be different than them and then bring gifts to me and how exciting that is, how cool it is. We all have access to these things, but the uniqueness of each energetic signature is what is all about the creation. Even when we look at nature, look at how many different species and how many different kinds of plants that there are. And it's like, it's all together in this one. It's all one, but it's all unique. It's all different, but it's all the same puzzle. It's all a version of the same idea. It's all, that's why you see the Fibonacci spiral expressing itself. And when you start studying numerology, you find out just how much divinity is really encoded into the universe as on a language level. And there's so many incredible synchronicities that occur just with 
just with numbers. And that's a whole other subject matter in itself. But what are your thoughts on numerology? What are your thoughts on divine mathematics? <laughs> oh, man. All I know is that when I was little, I got into this thing called math counts. And I just like really loved it. And it was like all this mathematics stuff and understanding the Fibonacci sequence. And like at a really young age, I was like really fascinated with all of that stuff and science and, and nature and all these things. And then as I got older and started learning about these things more with understanding these like patterns of the universe and seeing the Fibonacci sequence in our face and our ear and the equation of the body and in nature, like you said, it's like you can see it in everything. And it is very understandable. I love having this tattoo on my arm of the golden ratio and leading into the, the creation pattern. Everybody has seen this in a seashell. So even somebody who's not aware uh, consciously of, let's say, the Fibonacci sequence, they don't know that's what it's called. They don't know the mathematics behind it. Their eyes and their consciousness knows when they see it that it's like, it's a part of nature. And so I just feel like so deeply, whether we're actually conscious of the mathematics or not, our beingness, just seeing the pattern, it it's making all these connections in our brain and leading us to answers within of like really deeply understanding, you know, the universe that we are all these divine expressions of the universe manifested in the form. <laughs> Yeah, and the numbers give us the ability to actually be sure about the fact that there is a structure and a cohesion and an order and a type of law that governs things. And people that are very prone to egocentricity, which is all of us to an extent, will want to reject that notion of universal law. What? There's no morality structure behind the universe. And it's true that there's not one white bearded infinite guy sitting on a throne, writing a rule book, deciding who's naughty and nice like Santa Claus. It, of course, that's not going on. But there are limitations that are clearly observable in the reality. Now, whether or not limitations are permanent is another question. And it all has to do with perspective and wisdom. But those limitations give us freedom, as it turns out. And so recognizing them in the form of the mathematical harmony in the universe is a great way of realizing that, okay, this whole system is structured on law and maybe I can accept that there is such a thing as karma and that things are going to balance out. If I do this thing that I know consciously is wrong, then I can actually be mathematically sure that the same thing is going to happen to me. And mm. that is an interesting place to get to because it gives you motive. It gives you more motivation in a way, even if it's semi-selfish or self-preserving, but you begin to see the actual benefits of altruism and of course like we touched on at the beginning you have to make sure your own cup is full before you pour it out for other people but then the fact that you're even learning that through the fact that you start exploring altruism is just you discovering more law so recognizing that there is such a thing as truth and that it is knowable despite the fact that it's infinite and there's never an end to knowing it and learning it that fills the gap, that fills the hole, the black hole inside people of dissatisfaction with being because uh, you're filling that, that gravitational pull with something that's actually real and substantial as opposed to material objects or status or things that are seemingly physical and permanent but actually totally ethereal and impermanent. Whereas filling it with truth and recognition and understanding of law and knowledge of self that carries between lifetimes. That's invaluable. Yeah. I, whoa, well, you're just like, <laughs> I'm like having so many downloads, just you talking about it. It's so expansive. It's like constantly growing and expanding and these infinite possibilities and seeing that through law and just like even thinking, like, I love that we can be sure of these universal truths. It's like truth is subjective to each individual, but there are still universal truths that wind up all these different perspectives wind up pointing to the same truths. And like, that's how we can know. And, and 
even thinking about something as as simple as momentum. Momentum that, let's say, an airplane is taking off, like it has to have the resistance of the air pushing against it in order for it to take flight. Even in our lives, when we have all this momentum and we're doing so great and we're manifesting and all these things are aligning and to just see whenever something creeps in, it's like, you know, really challenging that it's like an opportunity instead of like giving it any sort of energy of just giving it gratitude. Oh, wow. Thanks for showing up. Thank you for showing me it. Like I'm headed in the right direction. Like I'm doing like, I'm doing some good work. Yeah, if you're rowing into the wind and it's hard because the wind is blowing against you, then you invent a sail and all of a sudden the wind becomes the thing that carries you to your destination. That's why the limits are there. They're not there to stop you from getting where you're trying to go. They're there to show you a better way to do what you're trying to do. So let's get in as we're, we're not really winding down. We've got a little more time, but I'd like to talk more about ceremonial stuff like cacao and uh, any other maybe ideas revolving around daily practices that you think people could really benefit from checking out and like maybe resources along those lines. Specifically, I think this stuff is important to talk about because our shadow frequencies, our shadow work is all actually in the body, clearing the internal resistance to changing for the better. People will go, how do I even do that? How do I, how do I deal with the fact that I don't want to change? Well, you start with the body, like we've been saying, and the change actually does come out from the frequency that your heart is creating when you're in one state or another. And so I think that's why movement practices, specifically energy practices, are so much more vital than the Western fad for yoga fully expresses. Not that it doesn't do that for people that are in it, into it for a strictly you know, exercise reason, it does it like that still it still has the same effect so it's good that people are getting into it but like i was saying before having the imaginary bridge means that you can use these practices whether it's yoga qigong even you invent your own or use tai chi these things can unlock the, the stuck parts of you i think yeah movement practice i really feel like is a major key of of being able to release stuck energy in the body for like flowing the energy flow in the body so we can tune in um, as well as like I was saying utilizing I utilize cacao in my practice and it's such beautiful medicine because when we can tune into our hearts and um, that's actually like where our answers are um, one thing that like we can do a simple way of really tuning into your intuition is like you can ask yourself something. You can get quiet and still in any moment that you need to know something. And and what I've found to be true for myself is that the answer that comes to me when I ask right away is the heart. And I can sense, I can sense the energy going there because really your heart actually, like they've done studies on it. Your heart knows, um, what's going to happen before it even happens. So like my heart already knows the answer before I even ask the question. So typically the answer that comes in right away is the heart. And typically the second answer that comes in that has the story wrapped around it because it had to go through logic and reasoning and past experiences and pursuing pleasure and avoiding pain or whatever that is like the story that's wrapped around it is like, that's typically the head. And so like tuning into the heart space and knowing that our heart's intelligence is, is far more stronger than the brain. Our heart like has its own brain and, and knowing that like our brain is so incredibly smart, what we're capable of, It's like uh, electromagnetically, our brain produces like four times the amount of of electricity than like um, a lightning bolt, our brain, four times the amount. And our heart is like 60 times stronger than that. So like, which one should we trust? (laughs) 
And I'm not saying that it's not important to use the head because I, I really believe that it is, but it's just, it's going back to that masculine and feminine energy of like allowing the feminine to lead and tune in, tune into the intuition and then take action with the logical aspect. For me, relationships that are imbalanced prove this because guys, I'm sorry to tell you, but the woman's always right. That's why the feminine side is the right side. Rightness and correctness are are correlated. <laughs> but what I mean by that is just trust that, trust the women in your life, and also trust the intuitive side of yourself. It goes hand in hand. And knowing, like, how do you trust yourself? Okay, if I really have to break this down, the answer to that question is, well, it comes from knowing one fact, like knowing one foundational thing. And no matter what your view on reality is, whether you have a religious view or scientific atheist view, Whatever it is, there's one foundational idea that is the thing that you had to choose as the ontological primary, I guess. And so why not make the ontological primary for your entire way of looking at the universe? I am the infinite creator and everyone else is the infinite creator. It doesn't make it. It's not like you're going to get put in a you're not going to get you're not going to get committed to an insane asylum for thinking that you're God as long as you treat everybody else like they're equal to you and also infinitely valuable and infinite potential. So if you have that as your primary grounds and you start living from that and knowing that, then it's going to work whenever you ask yourself a question or whenever you pick up a crystal because you want a certain energy or feeling to come in. It's going to work because you're not getting in your own way. You're allowing the infinite to express itself in the way that you actually choose instead of the way that you have to conform to because everyone says, oh, that's woo-woo or whatever. You get to write your own narrative in this thing. Yeah, so I want to... I want to touch base on what you said about the ladies being right. <laughs> uh, because when I th even think about, you know, in like tribal days, the women ultimately like had the deep say because they were the ones who are visioning i mean even you know they had these moon lodges set up for women that like were away from the masculine energies during their moon time and it's because women have the ability to literally vision quest every single month on their moon time they're the most powerful creatures on earth we can manifest anything that we want when we're on our moon time um, in fact that's why all the people would bring their prayers to the mooning women in the moon lodge because their prayers would be answered because the mooning women were the ones who were praying so like understanding really deeply that like you know when you think about it you would not be here without a woman Nobody would be here without a woman. Which is why it's so crazy to look at God as some like masculine being that somehow auto-generated the entire universe without the help of a female consort. And sorry to cut in, but I'll just throw out there that the Jehovah God that everyone's so crazy about in this uh, weird country we've got, he used to have a wife named Asherah. And then they cut her out of the story because they wanted, they wanted to change things. They also, you know, you're not allowed to even make art in that religion, so... Mm. anyway that, that's all it's all related though yeah that's interesting i haven't ever heard that that before but what i do know is that it's never resonated with me to call god a he ever it's like how can we possibly label something that is so vast and infinite that we can't even wrap our our minds around it and that it's everything it's everything how can we possibly label that into a into a gender it couldn't be god or goddess it transcends yes. the binary because it generates the binary yes yeah this is that it's all it's always like resonated with me to not call god a he and have this like masculine it just like never ever felt right to me never resonated with me but it is very powerful what you're saying about the the moon time because in ancient mystery cults of the long, long past where we had oracles and snake ladies that one of the sacrament in many of these ancient mystery schools was actually in some form mixed with menstrual blood. I have a really powerful story to share. Which is like the most taboo thing in Western culture, by the way. If you in some way ingested <sighs> menstrual blood, people would be really upset with you. And why is that? I wonder. I mean, I've never done it, but... 
it's usually what is most taboo that's worth looking into. In some cases, there's there's exceptions like you know, murder's taboo for a good reason, but that's obvious. I'm so glad we're having this conversation because this is a lot of um, of what my work is transitioning into, especially in this. Um, community that I'm getting ready to go and help build is um, I'm I want to be setting up a moon lodge for the women and be teaching them these like moon lodge teachings and working with their body and working with bleeding with the earth and it's really really powerful and I have a story that it was it's so powerful that like I could I could see that spirit had to reveal to me this powerful of a lesson for me to bring it through to the collective, which is cool because now we're having this conversation and all these people are going to hear about it. So I went to this teaching camp last year with this, with these Lakota elders and I experienced my first time in a moon lodge and was figuring all this stuff out. It wasn't until a few months later that I actually started taking it upon myself to consciously give my blood back to the earth. The earth is going to need the sacrifice of blood either way, right? So there's all this murder on the earth. And the more women that bleed with the earth, the less murder there will be. Okay, so it's very powerful. This is why there's been blood sacrifices and all these things. There's something powerful about blood, but understand Women have the ability, they have living blood. The only creature that can bleed without shedding blood in violence or in some mistake or accident. It's the only non-violent or non-harmful way that blood can be shed. It's living blood and not dead blood. And I had this experience where, wow, it was so powerful. It was a powerful night. The next day was going to be the lunar eclipse and I had some friends over and I was getting ready to bring my blood back to the earth and my friend was there and she was like, what are you doing? And so I shared it with her. And as soon as I shared with her the story of it and like why I was doing it, immediately thunder came and we're all really in tune with nature, we're all in tune with native ways. And so we were all like, whoa. <laughs> and so I go outside, I give my blood back to the earth and my, I had another friend staying and he was in a situation where he was worried about a friend and he was going to be with his friend there and just kind of got himself into a situation where there was just going to be some other things involved. And he was really worried about his friend. but he was with me that night. The next day we woke up, we had this beautiful cacao ceremony with the lunar eclipse at 5 a.m. It was beautiful. He came up to me afterwards and said, if I would have went with my friend last night, I would have had to kill three people. And literally those three people did not die that first night that I did that. And that was a clear message to me that the more women that bleed with the earth, the less bloodshed. A few drops of living blood is worth a lot of dead blood, it sounds like. I've never heard this concept before in, in this correlation before, but it's, uh, it's to me, it feels completely right that, like, why is, why is there a notion from long ago that the earth needs blood sacrifices. Why is that even a notion? And how does the way that this blood gets to the earth change what happens on the earth and what happens to all of us? What is blood? Blood carries water. Water carries information and memory and intention. If you intentionally bleed to the earth, that energy, that the frequency that's resonating in your water, that's you, goes and mingles with the waters of the earth and to me, there's your answer. I mean, there is a, even a physical correlate that we could one day trace this to, I would think. I mean, believe what you want, people. I'm just saying, like, why why wouldn't you try something so simple? If, if I had a period, I would be doing it. <laughs> I can tell you that um, I uh, one evening I had, like, a microdose um, of mushrooms, and I – did not give my blood back to the earth. And I literally, when I poured it, I felt, um, I felt all the pain of the earth come into me and it was, and it literally spoke to me and said, now somebody's going to have to die. Literally. It was so clear. And this is, it's so important. And what I've come to know is that when I share these teachings with women, 
I have not had one woman be resistant to this information, not one. And it's because it's so deeply ingrained with us that we know it's right because we know we've been as women, we've been just programmed and trained to believe that like, it's kind of a nuisance and yeah, you cramp and you do all these things. That's not true. When we are actually intentionally working with our bodies and our cycles and we're releasing, cause that's what we're doing. We're releasing out of our body. And when we're releasing life and we're digesting life in an appropriate way and we start working with each week, each seven days of a 28 day cycle. And we understand that each week represents a different season. And we start understanding that, Oh, when, when you're on your moon time, it's like winter and we go in, we go within and we kind of contract and we figure out what we're doing. And then there's a springtime and there's a summer and there's a fall and understanding that men, when you're sleeping with a woman, you're connected to her moon time too. And you can utilize the same energy of winter, spring, summer, fall, because you're so intricately connected with her cycle. And so it's like, really understanding that like our body is just, it's a representation of, of everything. And the more women that are connecting with their body, the more information is coming in and, and the more we can manifest. And, and it's just, it's so beautiful what's possible with, with really connecting with the body instead of just feeling like it's a nuisance. And, you know, back in the day when, when these tribes would get raided, the first thing that was destroyed was the moon lodge. Why? Because it was the most powerful thing of the whole tribe, the whole village. And it's like the more that we can get back to these ancient ways, the more we're, we, even when you think about a sweat lodge and what we're doing, men, this, it was originally a masculine thing because men don't bleed. Okay. So they have to go into a sweat lodge to cleanse and to release out of their body. That was originally just a masculine ceremony. Well, just in my intuition right now, I'm starting to, what's coming in for me is the physical correlate for men is ejaculation and the wasted, unconscious ejaculation, mm. the pornographic addiction of most males in our entire field, that is actually creating, to me, it seems like that's in, impacting the cycle of men oppressing women. Mm -hmm. and wasting our masculine essence in a, in a way there's I, I really think i need to do some reflecting on this because i think that just what you're describing from the feminine side of how our physical fluids balance with the actual energies of the world and how our intentional our intentionally alignment with or ignorance of our own cycles and our own fluids and our own connection to our ecosystem metaphysically and physically this is probably the most important information that any of us could be getting right now. I think it's a miracle we're even clear enough to be having this level of a realization be reached. Like there's, that's miraculous in a way, because if we're doing it, if we're talking about this, there are others that are remembering. And, and the more that we remember, the more we act on it, the more, the more the others will too, because it's all you. It's all, it's all us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And more and more women I can see are, waking up to realizing that they've got to reconnect with their living blood. Like it's, I can just see it in the collective, the things that are coming out for women to be more engaged with that time of their month and, and their, their, what they're releasing. It's just, it's shifting collectively and it's so beautiful to see. And the more that we do that, it does, it does shift the collective. The more that we really just like step fully into that and that knowing it, it's bringing the information through to everyone. So this is my favorite deck, the Mayan Oracle to use. I utilize this with my cacao ceremonies, my cacao ceremonies that I do. I was taught by um, some teachers in Mexico. Uh, I went on a healing journey with them after going through two divorces and just like wanting to shift patterns in my life. And um, I had had one person give me my galactic signature, but she called it the Mayan astrology, which is not true, but she gave it to me. She's like, I just see if it resonates with you. And it did. What is yours? The yellow rhythmic star. White magnetic mirror. Ah, neato. <laughs> so, um, so then I went to the darkening of the sun festival last year and I think I saw you there. <laughs> I was there. That's where I got that selenite staff. Yeah, cool. Um, and 
I went to um, Eternity's workshop called The Art of Time. And I went, and of course, you cannot squeeze the law of time teachings into an hour long workshop, but she gave us some really basic stuff, gave us our galactic signature. And I was like, wow, this really resonates with me because it's, it goes based off of a natural frequency of 13 moons and understanding that a woman's body has a perfect 28 day cycle. If it's in alignment with this natural cycle, like that's how it should be. So women that are listening right now, if your body is not on a 28 day cycle and it, it's like, there's different things you can do to, to get back in alignment with that. But that's why it resonated with me was that there are 13 new moons in our calendar system, not 12, not this Gregorian system that we're utilizing. And, and so 13 perfect 28 day months with one day out of time, it just, it just clicked for me that like raising up to that frequency was like it. So that was the second time that that system came to me. So get this, the day of the eclipse is the next day after I go to this workshop the following day, I'm on a flight to Mexico to go on my healing journey with cacao. And I'm still thinking about this workshop. And I ask my teachers, Hey, have y'all heard of this 13 moons of synchronic order? And they just like looked at each other and smiled. And he was like, I'm a master practitioner of that system. And that's what you're going to be learning when you're here. So literally it came to me again for the third time as I'm doing my healing journey with cacao. And then I find out like I was literally immersed in the system doing synchro galactic yoga every single day with cacao, with yoga, with meditation every single day for 11 days while I was in Mexico with these teachers. And they learned their cacao ceremonies from the chocolate shaman in Guatemala, which is where the Mayans are. I also have a 23 year old Mayan Indian little brother that I adopted that we adopted from Guatemala. And I lived in Guatemala when I was 16 for like six months at an orphanage there. So all this Mayan stuff, my whole life. And I now know it's in my Akashic record. Like I found it. It's a part of my mystery schools. And, and I, I, in, on different journeys that I take, I am with the Mayans a lot and with these, at these temples. And so it's like, it's here, it's in my field a lot. And so this card uh, deck was gifted to me by a friend after I got back from my journey with cacao, she went into this used bookstore in Fayetteville and found this. And then she gave it to me and it's literally, it's the law. It's, it's all the star glyphs, the tones, in this deck. So it's very powerful. This is what I use in my cacao ceremonies. And I love it because the energy just brings whatever card you need. So we don't have to set an intention with this reading. We can just know that whichever card comes through is exactly what we all need to hear. Yeah. And I think you can even listening now Ask a question if you want. You're still going to get the answer to that question. It's weird, but it works like that. It does. And I think synchro galactic is my favorite word of this conversation or of the last couple of weeks of my life or, or longer. I'm going to remember that one. I'll send you some synchro galactic yoga practices. Please do. Yes. It's really beautiful. It I'll helps. post it with the episode. Yeah, great. Yeah, so it helps you tune into the galactic plasma that's streaming from the sun each day that correlates with the different chakras in the body. And then when you do that, you tune into the synchronicities like today, synchronicity of today. Today is Thursday. The galactic plasma that's streaming to Earth has to do with the root chakra. Very tribal. Here we are meeting. That's a very tribal thing. I'm moving Right now, I literally have my house packed on the back of this trailer moving up to Missouri. That's a very tribal grounding kind of thing that's happening. So, like, these are all synchronicities of the plasma that's streaming to the earth today. You're the, in a red chair, and most of my guests don't sit in that chair. That's the, a red the, chair. The, we were talking about the moon lodge and the bleeding. Same thing. It's, like, all it's all very tribal. And we grounded at the beginning of the yes. conversation. That's also never been done in a... You know, I've advised people, hey, you should ground yourself. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> never quite like had someone actually do that for us. <sighs> I, I'm already getting excited for when you come back to the podcast and we do more because you're also going to be nearby. So that'll be easy to do. You're going to have to come back. You're one of my favorites already. Cool. Uh, 
got a lot of favorites, but damn, this, I've learned a lot. This is, awesome. <laughs> this is great. Okay. Psychic people. <laughs> yeah, no, this has been super fun for me. Um, all right. So I am just affirming that what needs to be said, be said, and what needs to be heard, be heard um, through whichever card chance decides to pick. There's no such thing as chance. Everything is law. <laughs> okay. New moon, new myth. Uh, new moon is yeah. what we were talking about a second ago, but I drew a card that says new myth. So this card comes from the aspect within this deck that are lenses. The qualities of this card, personal myth, meta myth, purpose, miracle on earth, new golden octave, path of innocence, present moment. So what's already coming in for me, this path of innocence, it's like going back to the child, like what you said, the imagination, being present right now, in the now, we're creating. Child of the sun, you're being called to wakefulness, to your place in the new myth. A great miracle is coming for planet Earth, and the time is now. A new consciousness will be created by the children of the sun as they ascend with the Earth to a new place among the stars. A new harmonic of light and sound, a golden octave, is being sounded on earth, ringing in the frequencies of ecstasy, union, and unconditional love. Child of the sun, why did you come to earth? You are the miracle of the new myth unfolding. You came to earth with a purpose, a plan, a master blueprint encoded in your feelings. Live in harmony with that plan. Open your world to the great mystery. You're being asked to view your experiences from a mythical standpoint so that you remember your connection to the larger pattern. Notice the metaphors of your daily life. The key to your personal myth is presenting itself. Your everyday world is infused with a vast mosaic of metaphorical meaning. Everything you do is relevant to the creation of your personal myth as well as the larger meta-myth. From now on, there are no more roadmaps, no more creeds, no more philosophies. From here on, your direction comes straight from the universe, moment by moment. This is the path of innocence, the path of trust. Here, each step is walked only once, and the universe speaks in the voice of the present. Feel the key to the kingdom in your heart. Know that, like the pull of heavenly bodies, love is neither taken nor given, but discovered and allowed. No one is without love, for love is the force that holds universes together. By simply embodying love, you are living in the new myth that will create the wave home. Surrender to love and awaken, child of the sun. I feel that that is wildly appropriate. I don't know about you guys. <laughs> wow. The new myth, I think that is what this podcast is about at its core, is that you get to write your narrative. You get to write your story. You get to decide who you are. And nobody else can tell you that stuff unless you decide that that's who you are. And and here we are, just nailed that. That was like, I mean, that's exactly the stuff we were talking about. And I'm sure if you went through that book, not every card is going to be about that exact thing. I mean, I don't know. I always pick the right card. You guys would too if you guys drew cards or if you do draw cards. I'm sure you do. Yeah, so some of the stuff that's coming in for me with this card is just understanding that um, this new myth very, it reminds me of the, uh, it, it's the new earth. It's the new earth that's here right now. The energy's here. This is what we're moving into, this new paradigm. Um, it's talking about the place of, of the child in this innocence and understanding there are no more philosophies. There's no roadmaps. We're, we're creating all of it moving forward. We can manifest whatever we want. Um, something that kept coming to me, I went to this vision quest camp, um, recently and understanding even how traditional these elders are. And, and they know that these, that these new younger elders are coming in and that it's, they're the bridge. It's the rainbow warriors that are coming in to bridge the, the old and the new. And it's like, it's time to transition into that. But it's like, we can't hang on to all of these old traditional things just because we want to honor the people that died and honored. And we like, it's time to like 
be like really whole and complete and heal that and move on because the time is now like, like the rainbow warriors are here the the prophecies coming into, into place. This is something that keeps coming. I've seen so many pictures this week about like with sun dogs around, around the sun, the full circular rainbow that in and of itself right there is fulfilling the rainbow prophecy, talking about the children of earth wearing beads and feathers in their hair and their hair growing their hair long. How many men now have long hair these days and just connecting back with the earth and, and all races and creeds coming together in unity and the deep down at our soul level, we will be the redskins, we'll be the natives, but we're returning. The ancestors are returning in these bodies of all different colors because we're all supposed to come together to bring this fifth world of peace to bring this, this rainbow prophecy through. It's here, it's happening. And it's so beautiful. Like that's what this card feels like it's about. And even just understanding that like love by simply embodying love, we are living the new myth that will create the wave home and surrendering to love. Like that is love is the energy of all creation, divine love. And it's there already just waiting to be discovered. How do you discover something? You get the thing that's in the way of you and it out of the way. You discover it. And if love's all around you and what's keeping you from being able to discover it is also you because everything's you, then all you have to do is get out of your own way. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, that's full circle because your perception of this is going to have to do with your physical health and your chakra health and the filters in your body and it looks like Madeline has got a little jam for us on her ukulele to close us out and I'm pretty excited about this so thank you for being here just thank you from the from the real bottom of my heart yeah thank you ground. thank you so much for having me and um just for your beingness thank you for being thank you for the work you're doing. Thank you for your belief in yourself and, and others in the world and humanity. And I just like honor all that you're doing. And I see that this grid that you're creating, I see it. I saw, I tapped into it before a guy here. I just saw it. It's just so beautiful. You just like streaming this out and the way that that's activating so many people and, and that's going out and sending these waves across everywhere. It's just, it's so beautiful. Thank you for what you're doing. That's, a, I think, all of our shared purpose, really. But, yeah, I'm, I'm quite happy and content to be in my place and my purpose sitting here with this microphone. It's, it is what I'm here to do currently. But I, I've got a lot more things to do at some point, like, like make beautiful music. And I'm very pleased that you're going to be making some music for us right now. And it's a rare treat in studio live music. So this song, I'll just tell you how it came through. It came across through many journal entries, but also different travels that I went on to these different consciousness festivals and the eclipse. And it's all of these cosmic happenings and paying attention to the planets and the sun and the moon and all of these alignments coming together and coming into wholeness with understanding that like all this whole polarity stuff it's beyond duality so like that's that's the name of of my band beyond duality and this song that i'm gonna play is called cosmic unions okay so i just want to invite everyone to where you're at if you're able to just close your eyes and relax and lean back and to just listen to um just to listen to what comes through for you and just let your imagination go with whatever's coming up in your mind's eye. Cosmic unions, cosmic unions, cosmic unions call. 
Wow. Thank you so much for leaving us with this really beautiful song. And what an amazing sentiment. Love is finally won. I really do appreciate it. Thank you so much again for sharing. Thank you for receiving. And I guess we could wrap things up with that. We should tell people MadelineElizabeth.com and look at the show notes for that. Also, for sure, I do complimentary 30 minute discovery calls with people to see if we're a right fit to work together. And whenever people are ready, I'm feels like I got a free session here. So thank you so much, Madeline. And I can't wait to get this out to the rest of the tribe. I guess that's it. That's it. Let's hang it up. Time to call it. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Madeline. We have done it. That was a great episode. And I really appreciate you for being here with us listening. You might have noticed if you've been a podcast listener to Interverse before that Typically, the episodes are about an hour long, and this one's a full-length two-hour episode, even for those of you that are not subscribed through Patreon. That's because I wanted to give this whole one out for free. It was a little late. The audio quality has some spotty parts, which I apologize for, and I'm working on getting better at. But mostly, because we're talking about such important self-healing topics and some of these ideas are going to require some experimentation in our own lives to even figure out how effective they might be or it might not be. I really wanted to give everyone the chance to hear the full extent of what Madeline had to say on this one. And so that's why the free show is containing the full episode content. And it's not just restricted to the plus subscribers. I hope you plus subscribers will forgive me, especially for the lateness. But if you knew me personally, you'd know I was working as hard as I could to get these episodes out. And sometimes once a week is not really how it goes down. And I will be getting the next episode out a little quicker for sure. So hopefully we can still aim for about four episodes a month. And if I don't pull it off, thanks for forgiving me. (laughs) I'm definitely trying. And so, yeah, here's a gift to you guys, a full plus episode for free. If you liked having a two hour long episode instead of the normal roughly hour long episode, You still could go check out patreon.com forward slash interverse, which you can find in the show notes and subscribe there. Support your favorite podcaster. Help me make this more of my vocation that I can actually get compensated for instead of just something I do out of the pure passionate care that I have for podcasting. I do love podcasting. I'm going to do it whether or not I start making a living off of it. But just like a good artist or a musician that you're into, And you would buy their print or you'd buy their CD. Look at Interverse Plus on Patreon as just that. You're supporting somebody and sending them a little energy for their creations that you're enjoying. And that somebody is me. So I'm particularly interested in you doing that. Of course, I'm not going to hold it against you if you don't. That's why I still put out a free show every week, of course. And I love you so much that I wanted you to get this whole episode, even if you're not a subscriber. Please do go check out the show notes for links to MadelineElizabeth.com. The music in this episode was by Suhan, the super heady spiritual gangster himself, one of my favorite DJs. So you'll find links to that there too. Thanks for being on Interverse with me, guys. I hope that we can make these changes that we're talking about in this episode completely. We can really cleanse our bodies and we can heal this world we're in. Or this world that's in us, you could say. I love you for listening. I love you for being. I especially love you for listening, though. And have an awesome week until we talk next. Got some great stuff in store. This podcast thing is just getting started for us, guys. Lots to learn. Lots of people to meet. 
and infinite love to create. Thank you for listening. I love you all. This is Chance signing out.